Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me on this Tuesday evening, May 10th, in the locker room. I'm Alan Locker. I hope you've all had a great week. Tonight, actress Susan Scannell Gilbert is here today to look back at her career and time working in daytime television. She is well known to fans for her roles on Search for Tomorrow as Kristen Carter, Emerson, Emerson and Ryan Tope, Gabriel Dubujak, along with appearances on One Life to Live and All My Children. She is also known for her debut role as Becky Hewitt on Another Life. Susan had the opportunity to write songs that her character performed. Another Life was produced by the Christian Broadcasting Network. Her roles in daytime led to a contract role on the ABC, ABC hit primetime series, Dynasty, and guest starring roles on Remington Steel and The 18. While acting, she kept her love of music alive by appearing at nightclubs across the country. It is my pleasure to welcome to the locker room tonight, Susan Scannell Gilbert. Hi, Susan. Hello, Alan. How are you? I'm well. Thank you so much for being here. Well, thank it you for inviting me. You are so welcome. Fans are very excited you are here. And uh, <laughs> I must... Thank your brother, Michael Corbett, for connecting My Michael. us. <laughs> you know, he, re he really is a soulmate. So, yes, I thank him, too. He's a great we, guy. We, we tried to get the two of you together. Just scheduling didn't work out back back uh, a while ago. But let, let's go back to the beginning. Where did you grow up and what was your childhood like? Well, Alan, I grew up in Lexington, Massachusetts. And I just normal blue collar, you know, kid going out in the backyard playing, you know. Um, I did plays in high school. We had a TV show called, uh, I think, Community Auditions. And I guess it was like a very um, starter level of American Idol where local kids and kids from tap dance school would come and, and they'd get votes from the audience on TV. And, and I always wanted to be on that. And mom and dad said no. And In, um, in Massachusetts, they had yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, community wow. Auditions, yeah. yeah long ago. That. Yeah, it was very sweet. And um, so I just kept wanting to do it. And I guess that's why I started, you know, did, I mean, did, did mom and dad put you into theater or was there something that triggered no, your desire to? No, no. My grandma on my mom's side, um, she had been in an orphanage, she came over in the potato famine and she always wanted to be a kicker, as she said, a kicker. It's like a dancer back in the day. Okay. And um, she was too <laughs> little. So I think I got that drive from her, you know, and then I wasn't and then I wasn't sure after high school what I wanted to do if I wanted to go to college or not, which is pretty common now. But back in the day, it wasn't so common. And so my dad said there's this um, summer theater thing at the University of New Hampshire, not too far from home. Why don't you go up there and, you know, pound a few nails? And I think he was hoping that I would not do anything and I'd give up. But I had a good summer and um, I pursued it. That's Much awesome. to his chagrin, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he suggested it, isn't that what you just said? Well, called his bluff, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah, exactly. But but you actually started out as a model with the Eileen Ford agency first, right? Well, it's kind of, you know, my life has been so many, I don't believe in coincidences anymore because I've had too many. Um, I was a musical theater major at the University of New Hampshire, which has a great program. And my sophomore year, my roommate's dad, I met him, and his name was George Porras. And he said, what are you going to do? And I said, I want to be an actress. And he says, well, you'll have to come to New York and stay with us. And I said, oh, no, no, Mr. Porras, I'm never going to New York. He says, what? I said, yeah, I'm just going to be an actress. To me, I, I, was, I was naive all my life, and I kind of hope I am still. And uh, I thought that being a star was doing dinner theater, having five babies and getting a leading role. And he said, well, honey, even dinner theater auditions in New York. So he, uh, I went to New York and he did me a favor of introducing me to the Eileen Ford agency. And um, wow. another coincidence, though they sent me back to college and they said, lose 10 pounds, come back. So I did. He said, lose more weight, come back. So I did. And a model didn't show up for a fitting which is where they try the clothes on you. You're not necessarily the girl who'll be in the magazine, but mm -hmm. they style it. And they said, Susan, can you run over there? And they had to sign a contract with me in order to get there like 10% of $25. So I came back the next summer to model 
not knowing anything. And um, it started the ball rolling. And am I um, correct that this was your first? That was my first job. Bruce Weber was the photographer. I remember we were in Central Park and he said, you know, let's try to get you a cover. He was so I mean, lovely. that photograph is stunning. Well, stunning. Lighting helps and so does a good photographer. <laughs> well, Bruce Weber, for sure. What, yeah. what do you remember? Were you nervous? Um, you know, I, I, I guess I just, I enjoyed modeling because it was acting to me. No matter what mm -hmm. they put me in, I would become the person that would wear that outfit. So no, I wasn't Never. nervous. I was just having fun. I was wow. too stupid to be nervous. <laughs> but you know, that's that's the important thing of anything you do to have a little fun. If you're that's not having right. fun, if you're not having fun, I don't think it's really, really worth it. Oh my God, I think you're so right, and I think um, a lot of people struggle with that to tell because mm. you know you got to pay the rent, so there's a compromise sometimes. Oh, for for sure. Sometimes we are absolutely in jobs just because we have to put food on the table. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. What, when did singing enter your world? Did, did you always know you had a beautiful voice? Um, no, I was actually quite shy about it. Like in high school, if I got a, I got a lead in my senior year and I didn't want anyone in my family to make fun of me singing. So I would go into a, I sound like such a weird person. I would go into my closet and put the coats around me and practice. And then I remember my grandpa who lived with us, I heard him. <laughs> oh, I was hey, mortified. <laughs> if you're getting the applause at home, that's a good thing. <laughs> I was mortified. But I just love it. It's, to this day, it's it's one of my favorite things is music and singing. I just I just love it. Yeah. Who, 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 you know, back then were some of your acting role models and, and singing role models? Well, I always wanted to be a mix between Carol Burnett and Barbra Streisand. That's, that's I, um, you know, reaching for the stars for sure. It sure <laughs> is. It sure is because nobody can duplicate them. But they they were just my idols. You know what I mean? I just thought Carol Burnett was so great. And um, I, I wish I don't think they could recreate her show today. I think the attention span needs quicker stuff. But for the audience, maybe your fans can oh. tell me if I'm right or wrong. I mean, but, I um, would die for that kind of humor. You know, just, always. I mean, we need humor with the world the way it is. Yeah. Um, Tracy Ullman tried, right? Yeah. He tried, but you're right. We need all the humor we can get. Yeah. Yeah. So they yeah. were my they were my guys. They were my go tos. Well, um, one of your fans, Chuck Stichler, I think is his name, said that you did a sing along at an assisted living facility during the pandemic in Massachusetts. Is yes. that correct? Oh, sure. Oh, sure. What was that like? Well, I moved back to Massachusetts in 2006 because my folks were not well. And um, I took a job as a secretary. And I, one day, the entertainer did not show up at mom's facility. So I just started a sing-along. And then ever since then, I go in and I, I sing at them. I, I love it. It fills my heart. And this was the pandemic. Well, it, must, it must, yeah, it must fill theirs. What a oh, great thing. Music just, can, I know like in those facilities and, and just with the elderly, I know that music can play such an important role in keeping them, keeping their memories too alive, I think. It's a, it's a different part of the brain. And yeah. there's a great documentary. I think it's called um, Alive Inside. And it's about this gentleman that's starting uh, this, he, Basically, he gets um, iPads and stuff for seniors, and he would put, he would ask the family, what music does he like? And this one man was all bent over, hadn't spoken in years, put his music on. He says, oh, I remember I was at a club with a girl named Shirley who did just, you know, and I've seen a few of those. Yeah. Wow. So with the pandemic, um, I have my own sound system. So I said to my wonderful husband, who I met here when I moved here at a gas station. Um, We're going to get there. I love that. I said to him, Love let's that. put my sound system on the car and let's go and we can be outside. So I emailed the person in the senior home, little songbooks, and everybody was at their window with a little songbook. And I went around to the different areas and we would have a sing along while I was outside and they were safe. It was cold. <laughs> That's it was in, cold. <laughs> incredible. Incredible. No, it was, 
Yeah. Well, speaking of singing, you got to, to write music and sing on your mm -hmm. debut role as Becky Hewitt on right. Another Life. But before That's we right. get there, Dan McKenrick just said, Susan added so much to our wonderful team on Another Life. Oh, I know Dan's name. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. You're very kind. What, what do you remember about, you know, the audition coming up for Becky or screen test? I don't know what you had to do for, you know, Christian. We, um, well, it came through the modeling agency. They were my agent oh, for TV. Yeah, they had a commercial department. And um, I went and to be honest with you, at the time I had a boyfriend, we were engaged and he did not want me traveling. So I didn't want to make the agent mad at me by saying no, because I wanted other auditions. So I wore a color I looked terrible in and I went to the audition. <laughs> Self-sabotage? Yes, I did. And and what what color? It was like a really bright purple. <laughs> it was like Barney. <laughs> and um, I got the role. I got the role. So, you know, and then um, it ended up that was not the person for me. So it ended up being, again, another coincidence, which, you know, put a wedge and blessing. saved me from a from an unhappy marriage. A yeah. blessing. Yes, a blessing in disguise. And um, isn't, isn't that interesting? And, and uh, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. the Christian yep. Broadcasting Network. <laughs> That's know, right. A religious, you know, network. That's right. You know. And um, I played the bad girl, which is, I suspect, why they had to do some searching, because <laughs> I don't think in their roles they had anybody that would really play a, a, a liar. You know, I always seem to play the bad girls. But um, yeah, and it was a great, it was a great thing because they had a university up there. So we we learned together. Where did, you, where did you film it? Norfolk, Virginia. Oh, wow. Virginia okay. Beach area. Yeah. And um, so I remember the heavy university and this guy was working. Boom. That's the microphone over your heads, mm -hmm. everybody, in case you don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, that you sometimes see in shots on TV. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> that's a and, that's a bad uh, boom operator or a bad mistake. <laughs> yeah. That means they didn't have time to do it again. Get it right. Yeah, Correct. But I time remember we did something and all of a sudden we hear this laughing and it's the boom operator laughing, but he's on mic. So he can't laugh. Cause all cause you pick it up, you hear it. So we had so many times like that. We would learn together, you know, and stuff like that. It was a good experience. And when I got searched for tomorrow, I was technically under contract still with um, another life. And they were just so lovely and so gracious. And they allowed, they worked around searches contract and allowed me to sh shoot two shows at the same time until everybody was done. Till we wrapped up. Mm. Um, David Hillman just said CBN University, which is now Regent University. That's right. That's right. Yeah. 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 Um, do you remember stepping on set for the first time on Another Life? Like, what, <sighs> um, you know, I know you weren't nervous necessarily for 17, but acting oh. in front of a camera for the first time. You're always nervous with acting because what if you forget your lines? You're always, something can always happen that way. So yes, you're, I'm always nervous for acting. That's part of the thrill. It's an adrenaline mm -hmm. rush of getting past it. You know, you know, like when you almost miss a step when you're walking down the steps and your heart goes, boom, um, <laughs> that's sort of what it's like, you know? Yeah. But um, I remember I, well, first of all, they had us, the actors came from New York and some of us, and we would stay in an apartment together. So it was again, lovely. I knew everybody before going in. And, and like college. Yeah, like college. <laughs> That's right, Alan. You're right. Um, so it was just, um, it was fine. It was, it was just somehow the theater training that I got at the University of New Hampshire just kicked in. It was all the same. I got it. Um, certainly, you make mistakes. You always make mistakes. But, mm. you know. a absolutely. Uh, David was asking, did they use cue cards or teleprompters on Another Life? No, they did not. I've never used. Never had the opportunity for that. No, not on any show. And when you took the role, you know, coming through the modeling agency, did you know at the onset when you signed for Another Life that you were going to write music or did that come later? No, that came later. That came later. I, I don't know whose idea it was. Um, Linwood King uh, directed and he also directed Ryan's Hope later. But um, yeah, they just did. They needed something to break up Becky and Russ. I had, in case you haven't seen it, 
I stole Russ from a lovely girl, a really good girl, and married him. And they needed to make that not work. So they had me go after a career and he was left in the dust. Well, isn't that what the bad girl does on a soap? <laughs> yes, that's right. She, she usually steals probably more than one. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not at once. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Maybe not on the on the Christian one, but on, <laughs> on some of the others. Yeah, <laughs> you never yeah. know. You never know. But the um, difference the difference between the Christian soap and the others is that they were trying to obviously give a message. Um, of course, one of the yeah. character who's married gets raped and they show the oh. trauma of her not being able to have her husband touch her and stuff rather than having her get over it and stuff like that. So, you know, they, they were had a mission through that, too. You know, what, when you look back on another life and then going on to Search and Ryan's, what do you think you learned at another life that helped you in those other roles? <sighs> just how to be really prepared on set, how to be ready. Um, everybody probably knows that you get anywhere, to, if it's a half hour soap, you know, you can get 10 to 30 pages of dialogue to learn the night before. Um, and then you time it, so you may have stuff added or taken away and you have to adjust. But I, I gained confidence. I gained confidence with my first soap. They were just so kind and, um, as I said, when I was a model, I, I've always thought I was kind of like scrawny. When I was a kid, I had to buy boys clothes out of Sears catalog because I was too skinny for girls clothes. So um, I never really thought, oh, oh, I'm a pretty girl. I thought I'm a good actress. And the hair and makeup people at CBN, Christian Broadcasting Network, they were phenomenal. They have phenomenal talent there. And they just made me feel like I was ready to be a professional. It's a good way to start, you know, it's your first yeah. role to have it be such a great environment. Oh, it was it was really a great, great not, start. Not, not everybody gets that lucky, you know, but. Yes. Yeah, you're absolutely good, right. It's a, it's a good way. Tell us about Kristen Carter and how the role for Search came about and doing, you know, was it scary to go ask, can I do both? <laughs> um, my agent did that, so I didn't have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. By then, I had a, my own agent called named Dolores Sansetta. She was a one-woman shop, small, only New York. She had partners in L.A., but she didn't have an agency there. And uh, they had an audition, and I came in for it. I remember, again, I was so naive. I was so naive. I would come in, and I'd think, oh, I have an appointment, so they must want me. I had no. I just didn't think about competition. I was just so naive. I thought, they're making time to see me. They must know they want me. I, so I, I came in confident. And I remember uh, Bobby Nigro was the casting director. He's, he's passed on and Jim Cramer. And I wore this gold lame Marilyn Monroe dress thing. I thought that's what you did. It's not what you did, <laughs> but I guess it made an impression. <laughs> and I did a screen Well, well the purple dress made an impression. <laughs> The gold, you know, you, you definitely are choosing correctly. <laughs> I guess so. I guess something. But um yeah, and then um, th my agent just worked it out behind the scenes that they could do both. That's so great. it was, um, yeah. What What was it about Kristen that you liked? Do you remember when you, you know, in, in deciding to take that part? She was sassy. She was a fighter. She, she could get petty. Not that these are all good things, but in a <laughs> role, they're good. Um, yeah. You know. Makes it more uh, fun for you. That's exactly right. Exactly right. Um, her wardrobe was fun. I worked with great people, Jay Akavone, Michael Corbett, Lisa Peluso. There's Michael Corbett. He played you my played brother. You, yeah, Warren yeah, Carter. Yeah, look at that hair. Look at that he, hair. He, both of you still got it. What do, <laughs> what, what do you remember about working opposite Michael? Oh, it just, we would laugh. He's such a good soul, you know? He, he, he's just... There's just no BS in Michael and, and you could count on him on set. He always had a twinkle and a sparkle in his eye, which is, which is wonderful because then you work off of it and it gives you more than you could even imagine at home before you've gone to work. You know what I mean? Yeah. And offset, he, he literally became a brother. I would say he, he is a brother to me. That's yeah. Awesome. And he kept in touch through all these years. We've kept in touch. 
Yeah, yeah he, he I, I've noticed that about him. And and the fans were just asking about these two lovelies by your side. Lisa I mean, th this Cindy. this looks like, you know, uh, a version of Jane Fonda's uh, workout video. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't it? It really does. It really does. And look, at they kind of look innocent and I kind of look mean, don't I? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, Lisa's you, you married You like the now. one in charge. Well, maybe not, but, you know, <laughs> I, she thought she was, didn't she? Yeah, that, yes. that was really a fun show. And, you, you know, it's a funny, just as an aside, um, New York has these coffee cups and they have this blue and white like Greek things. Mm -hmm. To this day, because Search had this cart in the morning, you come in pretty early, a cart with bagels and coffee in paper cups. And to this day, that blue paper cup, I just have this good feeling when I have coffee in a paper cup like that. I do, it's just silly things that brings stick back, with you. Brings back good memories. Absolutely right. That was a great show. Great I know you show. mentioned Jay Akavone when we were backstage. The fans yes. were asking about Jay as well. What do you remember about working with Jay? Jay, again, um, he would call often. We, we, were, we, were, we, we are buddies, I want to say. I've lost track of him a little bit lately. Um, he's still acting. He's still acting. So fans, write into your networks and say you want to see these guys, you know. Um, he's just, Jay is sweet. I remember the first time we met, we were on set, and he was playing a guy I was going to steal him. Again, steal a guy. If you remember, I lied to him. I, you have to marry me. I'm pregnant, but I wasn't pregnant. But when we met, we were sitting beside each other waiting for the director. And um, he said, yeah, Massachusetts. I, I spent some time in Walpole because he shot some film up here. He didn't mean the prison, but he, he just goes, wait, wait. No, I wasn't in prison. I was, <laughs> it's just just funny. Just funny. Well, well, Chuck said Kristen Carter was a great character. Loved the Brian and Kristen pairing. Yes. Yes, it was. We worked very well together, very well together. He's, um, his, his heart, his, his, um, how do you say this? Vulnerability is right, right in his face. I think that's hard for some men to do, but it, for him, it was very easy because that's who he is. Yeah. A lot of men hide behind that yeah. or, yeah, they... or put up a front rather than sh show the vulnerable side of themselves. Right. Due to society, but you don't mm -hmm. have to, most women are yeah. dying to see that side of you. 100%. What are some of your favorite memories from your time on Search? Well, um, my first, no, that was Ryan's, of Search, uh, let me think for a second. One time, I think it was some number of shows, like 75, 100 or something like that. And Lisa Peluso and I kind of did an Al Yankovic on a song and we got slides of everybody and the crew and everything. We had a little, little sing-along get together and making fun of everyone and that was fun. Um, we all got to go to Times Square and take a picture of the whole cast in front of the big marquee thing. That was fun. Oh, nice. Yep. Yep. I don't think we did any location on search. I think that was, uh, no, I don't think so. But, um, it was just all fun. I, I just, the characters, they, it was just so well written, so well written, you know, everybody from Sonny to everybody. And everybody Marcia was McC so Marsha McCabe. Marsha McCabe. And she's still beautiful to this day on Facebook. I see her, you know, she's, and she certainly is. And Olympia like... Dukakis, you know, I, I didn't realize this, but while she was on the show, she would be in the green room, which is where you hang out and relax. And she would just be like asleep in between takes before they needed her. Then I read her biography and it turns out her husband had this really bad accident. So she was taking care of him and working a soap and doing all these things. And, you know, she's, that was, that's kind of impressive. Hmm. It's kind of impressive. Yeah. Jerry was asking if you, uh, were you on the live episode? Do you recall? Oh yes, that's right. That good memory. Um, <laughs> yes. I, I, yes. Ellen said, if I don't remember something, you're going to remember it for me. So I'm hoping you will. Um, the thing I remember about that episode was that not so much what I did, that we had this young couple and God forgive me, I can't remember their names right now. Young kids. They're on for a short time and they were brand spanking new learning as they go. And it's a live show and a big black fly was flying around and landed on the girl's nose. But because it was live, she didn't know what to do. So she just kind of like let it stay there. 
and the cameras took a picture and she's having a conversation with a big fly on her nose. Then I just think that's kind of funny. <laughs> uh, another fan, Night, Night Owl Chad says the location they had Brian and Kristen was in Central Park. And a, right. Uh, and a song from Flashdance played uh, from the Flashdance yes. soundtrack. <laughs> yes, that was a montage. Thank you for that memory. And we were rollerblading or roller skating together. Yes, that was a lot of fun. That was a lot of fun. That was and, the producer, Bonnie and Bogart. And Kane DeVore as Danny was the character whose fly landed on his nose. You guys are amazing. <laughs> yeah, I told you. They, wow. They, they have great memories. Great memories. Wow, yeah. Uh, yeah. Tell us about Gabrielle Dubujak on Ryan's it's Hope. Pretty... I know Gabrielle it's a tough one. Dubujak, yeah. <laughs> Ryan's it's, Hope. Um, my first day on Ryan's Hope, I'm, I'm rehearsing. It's early in the morning and Larry Haynes, he's on, he's, we're at the table with the producers and the timer and everybody's there. And he goes, he says to me, I don't know anyone in the cast. I didn't watch a lot of TV. So I often didn't know people I would start working with. And he says to me in front of everyone, so have you ever worked with Larry Haynes? And I look at him, I go, I don't think so. He goes, really? You've never worked with Larry Haynes? I said, uh, no, I, I maybe, I, I don't think so. And he looks at everybody and goes, she's never worked with Larry Haynes. And it was Larry, it was himself. So, <laughs> so he broke the ice. He got, he got that's, us all That's a there. good way to break, exactly, to break the ice. Yep. Yeah. But it, um, I got cast for that. And then I didn't meet anybody until my first shoot was in France. Um, it was Excuse my first, us. right, right. <laughs> um, I was on a plane. I didn't know anybody. I sat in a seat. We were all in different seats. So nobody was near each other to say hello. And then Laura Rakowitz, uh, which was, I think, a PA, lovely girl. She came up and said, Sue, I just wanted to welcome you. We're all here. It's just this. And I thought, thank God I'm on the right plane. Because what if I was <laughs> on the wrong plane? I didn't know anybody. That's and, a good, thank God. <laughs> yeah. And so that was pretty exciting to go to France for that. And we had a scene by a castle where he's trying to kill me. Daniel Pilon is trying to kill me. That's Maxime Dubrujac. And uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. That show was fun. What do you remember about working with Daniel? Um, how much he loved his wife in real life, quite frankly. Yeah, she was a beautiful girl. I think she was French, dark hair, one of those exotic, beautiful women. And um, he just... Loved her so much. Yeah. And um, he also, I mean, everybody was always very reliable, which is great. Because if you show up on a soap not knowing your lines, oh, not so good. Yeah. Um, but Danielle was reliable, very kind. Um, just kind of low key, very kind, you know. I just remember how much he loved his wife, really, of all the stuff. That's you know? a great memory to have. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I they that. guarded they guarded each other, you know, which was uh, great. It sounds like great respect. Mm -hmm, exactly. Which yeah. is what we all want, don't we? You know, for sure. In a relationship. Yeah. Anthony was asking about your time on Ryan's Hope and the storyline uh, where you played Chessie, um, who was the dead ringer for Gabrielle. That's right. Um, how did you juggle the de-aging in your mind? Was it was it a tough storyline or did you like it? I loved it. I loved it. Um, the storyline was that Maxime's wife, Maxime's mother, soaps can get you very confused. So uh, Maxime's mother did not like his wife. She put her in an insane asylum. Then she, Maxime, I guess, was going to go get her or something. So she found me to look like her so that he wouldn't find the real her. And then the real her escaped and we met. Now, this was, um, I'm going to age myself, but this was before technology was so highfalutin. And the way we did scenes were, we did a day where um, Chessie would talk to Gabrielle in the scene. And so what we had to do was we taped it with me saying, Chessie says a line to her, pause, pause. And then I get changed. And she always had these wonderful hats and everything. It was really fun to be her with the accent and everything. And then I would have to look where I was standing before, but there was no one there. 
and react to nothing that was there and time it so I wouldn't talk over myself. Yeah, the technology is quite different today for, it is. for, for but, dual roles. Yeah, but I felt so honored that they would let me do that. I was That was really, really, really fun for me. Do you remember hearing that you would have to do that? What, you know, and were you excited, nervous, all of the above? Oh, I was thrilled. And I, they didn't tell me before. I found stuff out when I got the script. So oh. I was like, oh, okay. that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. How are we going to do that? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, that was, that was really, I want to say one of the highlights of my career is doing that. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I love, I love that's on YouTube now. And I, I get a kick out of that sometimes. Immortalized on YouTube. Mm. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's, 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 and and you had short roles on One Life and you played Kathy Lima and All My Children. What do you remember about right. your time in Pine Valley? <laughs> um, OK, I'm going to go blonde on you because I'm forgetting right now which one was that. Was that All My Children or was that? Uh, yes, one Kathy, I, I believe, okay. is All My Children. Pine Valley, because uh, Kathy was in court, so she didn't know where she was. Um, I yeah. was actually I had left the industry and I was working in Massachusetts um, running a, a dating service with my girlfriend. And uh, oh, wow. they called me and I, it was so fun. So I got to go back and dabble again because I do miss it. I, I do miss it. I would love to act again. I'm thinking maybe to try to come back. I'll go all gray and try and be funny. But um, they called me and I went over and it was such fun because I brought my best girlfriend with me and took pictures with her in front of the sign and all that stuff. But I got to meet work with Susan Lucci and um, that was really fun. And I got to be a lawyer, which was really fun. And it was just it was just like, I don't know, maybe lawyers have a lot of so words days. to learn. They do. They do. <laughs> but we, we won. We won. It was to get custody for Travis for the child. And I think we won. So, yay, team. Yeah, That's always fun. <laughs> exactly. Speaking yeah. of the name Travis, one of the fans uh, was curious, do you ever think about Becky Hewitt and oh, yeah. what she might be doing all these years after the series? What, you know, where she might ah. be? Hmm, isn't that interesting? Okay, I'm going to give this fan a question. And while I answer, you can be typing, okay? <laughs> what, I'd be curious what you see Becky doing after seeing her go through all the um, transitions and trying stuff that didn't quite work out for her. So I'd like to know what you think she does. I think Becky, um, she had this spark in her. She, she just needed to be special. So she's going to try and find something. I think she had that record career for a while. Um, and then I think maybe she had to go into coaching other artists. Um, and then I think she met a manager and got married and had a nice, calm life, but stayed in the arts by helping others. Is, that, is my friend typing? <laughs> he, yeah, he, he actually said he actually interviewed you recently. He's the gentleman who interviewed you recently, Travis. Oh, yes, yes, okay. <laughs> yes, all the time. It was like through email, typing back and forth. Might yes. be. I, I, I don't know. Hello again. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned earlier, were you, were you never really a TV viewer? Um, well, I would watch it every now and then, but I, uh, not like I abstained from it at all. Everybody unwinds with TV. But I would sort of watch it and forget it. Do you know what I mean? It was like, yeah. just like a, like, a, um, how can I say this? It's going to be taken the wrong way. No, I know. If, Some people, it's just a, a, a way to relax rather than yeah. be invested. That's yeah. that's how I take TV. I just kind of relax with it, kind of like a comic book or the Reader's mm -hmm. Digest or something, and and then just it's done and you're relaxed and you go on. Yeah. Yeah. There's, everybody d does it differently. What, um, all of your daytime roles led to a very famous television series, a little show mm -hmm. called Dynasty. A little show called what, Dynasty. What? How did the audition for that come about? What did you have to screen test? What What do you? I did have to. I absolutely had to screen <laughs> test. It was quite a, quite a, quite a deal. I, actually. I can imagine, you know, for an hour and spelling show. <laughs> mm -hmm. And at, for, before I even start, I'm going to say that with Aaron, if 
anybody had trouble on a show, there are personalities and sometimes somebody's oil and water or something. He would never fire anyone. He would move them to another one of his shows. So I just want to say that because that's a lovely, lovely thing. Um, yeah, I've heard really in doing my show, really lovely things about the, the man. Yeah. I mean, he was an innovator, right? You know? I mean, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Dynasty was through my agent. Uh, my agent also got John James on Dynasty, the Jeff Colby. And so she had a slot and I went and auditioned for it. And I think they were, they were torn between who to take or something. So I screen tested for it. There we are. There we are with John Forsyth and John yeah. James. Yep. And the munchkin. And, um, so then supposedly I had it. And now at this time, I was still living in Virginia Beach. So we had to move the house. I was married at the time to a boy named Chris Rowland. And um, we had to move house. So we got a, a SUV. We had a little speed boat. We were towing a boat with an SUV with a dog and a cat and a litter box in the SUV. Oh my God. And what do you know, our transmission catches on fire while we're driving to go start the show. So we stop, we, we go in the next town and unbeknownst to us, it's called, the town is called Truth or Consequences. It was named after the game show. <laughs> and my agent calls me and says, Sue, they want to see a, a different type of test. You have to go to LA, so hop a flight. I said, there's no airport here. Oh, well, well Aaron will pay for um, a limousine. There's no limousines. Well, <laughs> rent a car. There were two cars in this town and they were gone. So then um, I had to take a bus. So I took a bus and they put me in a hotel. And um, it, it was kind of strange. I think they just weren't sure which girl they wanted. So it was just a quick little test and I got it. And then we, we fixed, the, <laughs> fixed the truck and my ex had to come out and meet me there. Wow. It was quite a story. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm going to yeah. tell people don't travel with a dog and a cat in a litter box <laughs> across the country. Yeah. Not across the country. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Wow. So, that's crazy. Yeah. Do you remember and, ste stepping foot on, you know, c coming from the daytime world to st stepping foot on a primetime show like that? Do you remember what it was like? Well, I didn't. I again, I'm so sorry, but I just wasn't that familiar with it, you know, to be honest with you. I and think I that's remember, a great way to, uh, you know, to really approach you and not definitely doesn't make you nervous because if you right. don't know about it, you know, it's just right. another, another gig really. Right. Yes. So the night when they offered to me, I called my mom and I said, mom, there's this show they, they, they want me to do. It's called dynasty. She goes, honey, take the job. <laughs> <laughs> so I took it. But then the next day I go to work and I see all these people that I've seen on billboards that I guess I pay attention to billboards. And I said, oh, mom, I'm working with billboard people. <laughs> oh, my goodness. And, um, you know, the cast was fine. The cast was lovely. <coughs> I mean, you worked with John James, John Forsyth, yes. Diane JJ. Carroll. Mm. I mean. Diane that's... Carroll. Yeah. What a lady. Yeah. That's pretty good stuff. And John, um, John Forsyth, he would, you know, he would come over. He was just such a sweet man. He would always talk about his grandkids and mm. about herbal tea. He loved his herbal tea, that John. <laughs> and um, Well, he's think? Charlie and he's Blake to me. I did. I was a big dynasty, but Charlie's Angels was a show I grew up on. Oh, so That was a good yeah. show. That was a fun yeah. show. I mean, an, an Aaron show introducing three ladies as leads, you know, right? he first, first guy to do that. So pretty, yep. pretty impressive. That's right. And the Mod Squad, didn't he do the Mod Squad? He might have. He I did, think he it did. Might have, and the uh, Diane Carroll show. Julia, right. was it Julia? Yeah, Julia. Um, he might have done the Rookies. I'm not sure which one now. I'm, yeah. Yeah. Good for him. Yeah, he was definitely, like you said, an innovator for sure. Yeah. yeah. Was, there, was there a reason you left Hollywood behind or you just gave it up? Um. <clears throat> well... I'm going to be frank, Frank. Um, <laughs> I had a me too moment. Oh, I'm and, sorry. Yeah. And uh, on Dynasty. 
Oh. And I actually didn't even realize it till later what happened because they were a little tricky with me. But um, I remember. Well, I can imagine back then they weren't taking things serious. You know, look how long it, you know, Dynasty is so long ago and look at. Yeah. Yeah. You two really just happened. You know? Yeah. So um, this person was asking for some stuff I was not ready to give or going to give. And uh, mm. it ran us over budget, made this person look bad. And she was very tight with people. So um, I took the fall. And I didn't wow. really know it. You know, um, it was odd because, well, to be frank, I had a five-year contract that lasted, as everybody knows, uh, I think 13 weeks. And I remember somebody from paparazzi called me and said, they're having a big reunion, Susan. What are you wearing? And I was like, what? I know nothing about this. And it turns out that I was being let go. And my agent called and said, you know, Sue doesn't quite understand if it's a character thing. We understand. But, you know. So um, I really couldn't find more work there. I heard that not this lovely agent I was telling you about, but someone in L.A., they were telling um, casting people that I didn't show up on time. They were making lies yeah. up. And so I, I understand that now from a business viewpoint. If they've got 20 people, they need to, to go earn money and make money. You don't tell a major show or a network, you know, that you're going to stick by someone. So, um, but God works in mysterious ways. I moved to New York. Um, I opened a theater. Anybody in New York, please go to the Astoria Performing Arts Center. It's in Queens, New York. And that was another highlight for me as a person. Um, what, what brought you there? How did that come about? Kawinky dink. Um, another one. Another one. My eye doctor. Um, <laughs> I love that. I know. My, my eye doctor. My eye doctor was friends with the local principal of a high school and they were rededicating it as an art school. And she wanted somebody to give voice lessons to this little boy. So I did it. And then I taught some after school theater programs there. It was a rough school. And um, then I just, these kids, some of them, like one girl was so gorgeous, this little girl. And I thought if she's left alone this summer, she'll, she's gonna have a baby, she's gonna get pregnant. So I asked the kids if they'd be interested in doing some theater and they said, yes. So I found a church that would let us use it. And then the kids decided, Hey, I'm not spending my summer in the, ch in the church. Um, so I, it ended up being a professional theater and I got the kids to work backstage a little bit. And then I opened a kid's program that was free. The Port Authority paid for it, which was great. And then I opened something called Senior Stars, which is for seniors to come and do a show every year. And in Queens, which is the melting pot of America, a school has like 138 languages to contend with, a school teacher. Wow. Yeah. So these people would come to audition and they'd have like these instruments from their homelands because they had Im immigrated. And back in those days, remember that was the depression in those years and everything? They couldn't pursue dreams like this. And it was just a joy for me to see that. And then I moved home here for the folks. What a great way to help, you know, keep children off the street or, oh, you know, out yeah. of, you know, uh, pregnancy and, you know, that situation. Sure, absolutely. Because theater, I think theater and sports, they teach you to be a team. Everybody gets their own little time to feel great, to get ac acknowledgement, right? Um, and, uh, you learn things about yourself. Do you, do you know if any of the kids continued on with it? <laughs> um, I don't know. I just remember one kid, they asked him what he wanted to do. He said he wanted to be the beach boys. I thought that was very cute. These are little, <laughs> these are little kids, <laughs> but there was, there was a story of, um, one boy and he was a little learning disabled. He couldn't read well. He was dyslexic and his mother called before the auditions, everybody got in, but we made you audition. And um, she said, 
honestly, I've tried to get him involved in no matter what he gets involved with, he comes home less, less because they make fun of him or something. Mm. So we said, have him audition. And in his audition, one boy is here reading a line and one boy is here reading a line and he'd read his line. And then the boy in question wouldn't be able to read it. So this kid jumped over here and read his line and read, and he jumped back and forth for the kid. Well, it turns out this young boy had a beautiful voice. So they gave him like the very last solo in the whole show. And the local preacher church person heard him and asked him if he would sing a solo in their church. And, uh, and it was like the first thing I think that he got like, you're special, you have a talent. And those are the memories that, that I remember. Yeah. It's awesome. I love that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and speaking of singing again, were you in a, a all girl band? <laughs> yes. That was through the modeling agency. Phantasm. Phantasm. It was supposed to be um, a female version of the village people. And <laughs> okay. some of you will remember the village people. And the, the producer was from France. He came to New York. It was all models. And I was the only one who did my own vocals. And so when we went to France and I spoke a little French, a little bit, I, I could do the talk shows and stuff. Um, but it really didn't, it didn't go anywhere, but it was a lot of fun. We got, there's nothing for me than like going into a recording studio. It's just such a high. It's such a high. I love it. So that and was fun. You re recorded your first album for Another Life. Was that when, or did you do it before that? That, um, Alan, that wasn't really an album. That was uh, an appearance. And that did let me join um, ASCAP, which is a musician's thing. Yeah. Um, but I got, to, I, it's funny, you know, chapters in your life. I remember sitting at a piano in an empty room at CBN, just playing chords and humming. And their musical director, uh, Brent Havens, I asked him if he could make it into real music for me, and he did. And then we could use it in the show. I think it's on Spotify or something like that. But yeah. That's amazing. But you also got to sing the national anthem at Chase Stadium. And that's scary. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's the first thing that scared you. I <laughs> well, jitters is different than scared. Um, okay. But First of it's all, a, it's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. You don't get paid. Um, the stars during halftime, you know, the stars, they get paid, I'm sure. But yeah, I didn't get paid, but I got to like bring somebody for free and eat, you know. But um, what they do is they take you and they walk you through the team's locker room. The boys are not there. Don't get excited, girls. And, <laughs> um, and you just sit there and wait. And so I, they had their marketing person stay with me. And so she, I said, do you mind if I vocal warm up? And she goes, okay. And I just got a little devil in me. I went, oh, Flay, can you flee? And she looked at me like, oh my God, what have we got here? And I told her I was kidding. But you go out there and there really is a delay. Like I'll say, oh, say, can you? And then all of a sudden, while I'm trying to say other words, I hear really loud, oh, say, can you? But it, it was fun. It was fun. That's it's a, amazing. It's a little scary. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I still don't know what a rampart is. <laughs> nobody does. Nobody knows what a rampart is. No, no, yeah. nobody does. <laughs> Do you have, you know, um, favorite music when you did done your act that you love singing? Yeah, I'd say I would do the same stuff Michael Bublé does. I love those songs. I just love the, you know, the Sinatra, the Judy Garlands, Gershwin. Um, I tried one time to do rock and roll because somebody told me that's what you have to do to get arrested. And <laughs> don't get arrested. <laughs> <laughs> And it was such a disaster. I was doing the song, you know, it, she, he's as cold as ice, he's willing to oh, yeah. sacrifice. Yeah. Foreigner. And um, mm, oh, yes, that's, that's right. You're right. Um, and actually, my band was like the cameraman sound um, from Christian Broadcasting Network. And I had them come out from Virginia and they slept on my floor. And we did a club called Caroline's. And, uh, Oh my God, I was so bad. I was so bad. I am not a rock and roll girl. It was, it was, it was 
just not good. <laughs> but I tried. But I if really somebody, love the Michael if, Bublé type of act. Type of music. Yeah. If somebody would say, yeah, you know, only one song, you know, now, what would you pick? Hmm. Either the nearness of you. Um, Cry me a river. Mm. Yeah, one of those guys, I think. I'm a ballad girl. Yeah, I love mush. I love lyrics, you know, and, and I, I, I like to hear lyrics. And, um, you know, the fashion now is to put the music ahead of the lyrics. And I find mm. that so frustrating because I want to hear the words. But that's mm -hmm. my musical theater background, you know, wanting to hear the words. And well, speaking of musical theater and, and the stage, uh, do you have a favorite stage role? Ah, <sighs> you know, I have to say, um, oh God, I can't think of the character's name. Hairspray, the bad mama. Can't think of her name right now. I'm blanking. Uh, oh, Van Tussle. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that Velma was a Von Tussle. Velma Von. Thank you, yeah. thank you for being my memory. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's I a really, great character. Oh, she's fun. She's fun. And mm -hmm. um, let's see what else? What else? What else? Moon over Buffalo, the crazy mm -hmm. woman in that. She's fun too. I love comedy. I love big. Yeah. If you could pick a role today that you would love to still do, is there one? Hmm. I want to be Carol Burnett in the document or in the life story when they do a movie of her. I want to be her. Ah, that would be so, amazing. Not an existing role, but one that's coming yeah. I would like. Yeah. You need yeah. to write it. Um, <laughs> Terry was asking, what's the song you wrote about a man and a glass? Do you remember that? I didn't write that. Uh, a man named Fred Barton, who's a great writer, an amazing musician, piano player and, and orchestrator. Uh, Fred Barton wrote, it's called Pour Me a Man. Booze, mama told me, booze will keep you happy till you're six feet under grass. And though I've toasted mom in heaven, I've known since six or seven, da -da -da, never come to. Anyway, basically, it makes all these analogies of a man and drinking a man, drinking a man, and it's a dirty song. <laughs> it's called and, Pour and Me a Man. And was that a Becky, Becky song? No, that's just a club song. That person oh, a club song that you did. Yeah, Did that? Okay. Does that person ever go to Don't Tell Mamas? Can you type to Alan? It, oh, is is that where you perform that? Sure. Oh, I love Don't Tell Mamas. Oh, don't uh, you? I've done a couple shows there. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Yep, I haven't been yep. there in. I just had a friend who stayed uh, next door, basically. Oh. And I, from London, they were visiting, and I I was telling them things on that block on Restaurant Row to go. Oh, yeah. And I, Don't Tell Mama was one of them that I was recommending to go. Oh, Don't go Tell check, Mama's. Go oh. check out a show if you could. I haven't been there in decades. Right, but I, right. Yeah, it was a great, it was a they great have, place. I think they have two showrooms now. They used to just have one, if you remember, from when you were there, Alan. But yeah, and then they have the bar where you just, everybody gets up and sings. Yep, yep. Yep. Jane just said she looks so much like Carol. I believe she'd do a great with the role. Oh, God bless you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Carol would be an amazing, amazing part. Oh. Uh, you mentioned your husband and you mentioned a gas station earlier. I did. I did. <laughs> Tell My us that hubby. story. My hubby wubby. Um, I mean, that's a good story for people to hear, you know? Okay. Where'd you meet your husband at a gas station? Uh, <laughs> right? I mean... People are always looking to meet somebody, you know, smile when you're well, out and about. Thank you, Alan. That's <laughs> it. People are like, I can't meet anybody. I can't meet it. But when somebody looks at you, do you take the opportunity to say hi? Just say hi. That's all, you know? And if they say hi to you, I, so many people, you say hi and they go like this, like, like oh, it's something totally, wrong. Yeah, totally. It's like they're shy, you know? People have an easier time being snooty than it is to be kind. And, you know... I'll get to that story in one sec, but you reminded me when I was modeling, all the ads were smiles and smiles and swings and happy. Now modeling is this. Oh yeah. yeah. Right. And that yeah. says something about society. Yeah. So please people, if you can smile, it's free. It's a gift to others. And, and um, before you go to the story, Dan, who you worked with said, as a final comment, Susan made my work as the director of photography so easy. 
She was a joy to work with. Many thanks. Yeah. But please tell me, tell me that story because I love it. <clears throat> All right. So I was coming home from work and a really hard day. I had moved to Massachusetts. I didn't really know anybody yet. And I was just really cranky, really cranky. And I had to pull into a gas station to get gas. And my now husband, I see this man in a black car pull it like three turns, like a lot of turns because he wanted to get a pump. And it happened to be the pump I was going into and I was first, but he got it. So I was not happy with this man. <laughs> and I just looked at him and he goes, what? And, and so he moved his car back. And then I, we're, I'm pumping and, and he's, he's pumping at his pump. And I just started laughing at the thought of so many U-turns. He did like three, three corner turns to get this pump because he didn't want to do a U-turn in a hundred yards. So anyway, um, <laughs> I'm laughing. He goes, what, what? And I said, I'm sorry, but if, if you work that hard at your job, you must do really well. And he said, why? And I, we started laughing. And then he said, where are you from? And I said, Queens. And he goes, oh, I grew up in Queens. And his name is Bob Gilbert. And he, and he, he said, uh, what's your name? And I said, Sue. I said, what's your name? And he said, Bob. His mother's name is Sue. My father's name is Bob. Um, wow. We just had a lot in common. And so... He's the first man I ever had to chase. He was playing in the field, if you know what I mean. And so I had, so he exchanged numbers and he did not call me. He was seeing someone else. So I emailed him uh, from the 279 a gallon gal, because that's how much gas was. I wish it was that again. Yeah, me too. And, yeah. And so um, by the time we had time to go out on a date because of our schedules, as Alan, you know, with me. Um, it was sev <laughs> several months. So I forgot what he looked like. And as he says, I had sunglasses on that were like this, you know, two <laughs> big things. So we didn't know what each other looks like. So I had him meet me at the house and uh, we went out to eat. And I just kind of wanted to get closer to him. You know, I wanted to like touch his hand a little bit or something. I was being very forward. So um, I got tarot cards out. And he's not knowing anything about it. I thought, you know, get close with the cards, you know. And uh, first card he pulls out is the marriage card. We were both terrified. That was the ah. end of that. He was out of there. That was the end of that date. And then I remember um, after my first marriage, I just never wanted to get married again. And I had actually said to him, if you promise never to propose to me, we will be together forever. Then I changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> So, and he's just perfect. I mean, within a month, we were finishing each other's sentences. He's kind, funniest guy I've ever met. Kind, um, innovative, creative. Those are the two, the two, two best qualities, kind and funny. Kind, funny, and patient. And that's a good relationship, you know? I, yeah. I love that. And yeah. are you working on a project together? Yes. He retired recently and he wrote a screenplay. And we produced it during COVID. We did everything ourselves. I directed. He was on camera. We just, uh, Dan, it is not like those days. But, <laughs> um, and then he wrote a sitcom, which I think is very funny. And we're editing that. So, um, and we all do, we do it all locally. And we use people locally. It's non-union. It's just, and we hope to sell it to Netflix or, or something like that. That's awesome. Yeah, Congrats. he's a good writer. He's very funny. Yeah. So that's I, I, all. I love that. Well, the fans would love to see you on, on screen again. Write those letters. Say, you remember that broad? Remember that little broad <laughs> from where back when? Well, somebody just said uh, their name is username. There, there is no name, but they said, oh, my God, I'm addicted to another life. And Becky is the character I love the most. Oh. Well, what a dream to have her here now. Oh, it's thank a pleasure, you. Susan. Thank you so Alan, much. Alan, right I back at you. I'm so Thank glad Michael uh, connected us. And Absolutely. He always does good things. He d he does. He, he stays in touch. You be well. Stay you be well. well too. All right. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks again. Oh. Thanks, everybody. What a great interview. I had a blast. Thank you to Susan Scannell. I, I'm trying to pronounce it correct. She said Scannell like flannel. Susan Scannell Gilbert for joining me tonight. Join me on Thursday when the ladies from the edge of night, Marianne Alda, Sandy Faison, Karen Needle, and Joan Taylor join me live. 
Please subscribe to my YouTube channel if you haven't already done so. Turn on the notifications for reminders of all upcoming shows. And if you haven't done so yet, please visit thelockerroom.com and check out my new website. Have a great night, everybody, and I'll see you Thursday afternoon right here.